So, <clears throat> good morning, everybody. And uh, I understood uh, yesterday that I was supposed to give a keynote lecture on ice mechanics, and obviously it's much, much too ambitious for me. So I will just try to um, discuss and introduce uh, some uh, concepts and tools that maybe can be uh, useful in the context of uh, calving. And I would like also to stress that I'm not a specialist of uh, glacier or calving. I have been working on uh, ice mechanics from the very small scales to uh, sea ice, but not so much on, on calving except to, uh, uh, during the last few years uh, with, uh, with Jean. Okay, and uh, <clears throat> as uh, it has been already stressed, uh, if you want to know almost everybody about ice mechanics, this is the reference by Alan Chilson and Paul Duval. Paul, who uh, received the um, Seligman crystal uh, last week. But Paul essentially uh, describes the creep of ice, and I will today essentially uh, speak about the fracture of ice, which has been described in this book by uh, Alan Chilson. Okay, so. As this is a kind of introduction, I will start with really the beginning. So if we are speaking about mechanics, we start from the Newton second law. And then we will consider deformable bodies. And then we have two choices. Either we can consider that the materials remain continuous or not. So if you consider that the materials can be continuous, this equation translates to the well-known Cauchy equation. And if you add some uh, more um, hypotheses, like, for example, the fact that the material is incompressible and is a Newtonian and freed, you will get the Navier-Stokes equation, for example. And if you add the hypothesis that you have negligible inertial forces, then you get the Stokes equation that can be used sometimes to describe, for example, the flow of glacier. But I will not discuss this. Uh, problem today, but instead uh, I will consider the case essentially when we have uh, we applied <coughs> the load at a very high rate, and in this case the material can be considered as elastic brittle, and in this case the way to deform the material is through the uh, creation and propagation of fracture. And so in this case, you, cannot, you can no longer consider that the material is continuous, except with some specific tools such as damage mechanics that I will explain later, uh, present later. But <clears throat> uh, we have to use different tools such as fracture mechanics, or sometimes in case of CIs, for example, here, you can use uh, granular mechanics. Okay, so first some definition. What is brittle behavior? What does it mean, brittle behavior for, uh, in mechanics? So if we consider a lab test, you take a piece of ice and you uh, compress it at a different rate. If you have an absence of significant inelastic deformation before the failure of the material, you will consider that this, your macroscopic behavior is brighter. You, do, you are not able to detect any kind of uh, significant plasticity or creep. Another definition is just the presence of fracture or fault. So this means the creation of new surface in your body. And so this means this implies that the continuous description in this case becomes problematic because uh, actually your body is uh, uh, separate into different parts. <clears throat> and so if you want to keep a continuous description, you have to use specific tools such as damage mechanics that I will explain, uh, describe later. But at a more fundamental level, to separate uh, brittle to ductile behavior, you consider that inelastic deformation is either accommodated by the breaking of atomic bonds, so this is brittle behavior, 
uh, in this case, this can happen if you apply the load at a very uh, high rate. Okay, this is a fast process, and this is also favored by a lower temperature. But you can have the competition between this breaking of atomic bonds or and the motion of dislocation that uh, is uh, that carries uh, plasticity or the motion of vacancies, for example. So in case of ice, this uh, mechanism's <coughs> diffusion of vacancies is not uh, relevant, but for other materials like metals and so on, it is very important. Sure. And in this case, you have a ductile behavior, but this is a slow process. This, these are slow processes, and they are favored by higher temperature. Yeah? Uh, when you said you apply the load fast, do you mean that the rate of change of imposed stress is large, or do you mean that the imposed stress itself is large? No, the, uh, <clears throat> the rate of stress, you change, or depends of uh, both are, no, this is a strain rate, which is large, but if you applied, so to, to, to get a large strain rates, you need to apply the stress at a high rate or to immediately, uh, for example, if you are considering a creep experiment where the stress is constant, you have to uh, impose a large stress. But this, yeah, uh, this is essentially in terms of rate of deformation. Yeah, consider slow or fast. But you, the, you do not necessarily impose the strain here. You can impose the stress, but the result, what, when I say fast or slow, it's in terms of uh, strain rate. Okay? Okay, so here maybe it will become a little bit clearer. <coughs> Here is a kind of uh, deformation curve. So you have here is a, a stress versus a strain. So here is, this is a kind of test you can do applying a constant strain rate to the sample of ice, for example. And <clears throat> here I increase the strain rate. So if I apply a slow strain rate to my sample, I will have a very smooth curve. Okay. So this is the kind of ductile, microscopic ductile behavior. Okay? And as I increase the strain rate, I will have a transition from ductile to brittle behavior. And in case of brittle behavior, I have almost a linear behavior, so without any uh, inelastic deformation, until a failure, sudden failure of the, of the material. And this behavior, is dependent on temperature, strain rate. So strain rate is this one. So if you increase the strain rate, you are going from ductile to brighter behavior. And the effect of temperature is the reverse. So if you increase the temperature, you are going from brighter to ductile behavior, just because the slow processes that allow uh, ductility, like uh, dislocation motion or vacancies, uh, diffusion, and so on, they are favored by higher temperature. And so this means that in terms of time scale, the brighter processes are at small times, occurs at small time scale, and the ductile uh, processes occurs, occur at long time, at long time, time scale. Okay, so from laboratory experiment, we know at about which strain rate, we can see the transition from ductile to brittle. So this is for uh, intact granular ice, I mean, without any defect, uh, uh, fresh water ice prepared in the lab. And we, if we apply tension, the transition strain rate is around 10 to the minus 4 per second, and under compression, 10, 10 to the minus 3. So this is an order of magnitude. And this will maybe depends on also on the grain size, on uh, the amount of impurities, on it also depends on temperature, obviously. Uh, but at least you have the order of magnitude. Yeah. Okay, so now um, 
I presented this distinction between ductile and brighter behavior. And uh, as far as I can understand it, Calving, um, <clears throat> in, in the problem of Calving, you have propagation of fracture within a non-Newtonian flowing body. So the problem is that can we consider the material as being brighter because we have cracks or as being ductile because we have glacier flow? Or is it possible to separate these two things? And I think it's, this is the main problem here. And this problem is not trivial. It's not trivial even in, in uh, current uh, uh, development of in mechanics. And so uh, the way to deal with that so far is to try to separate the time scales between long time scale where a material is uh, uh, flowing as a non-Newtonian uh, fluid or short time scale where it can uh, be considered as an elastic body with fra uh, fracture propagating in it. OK, so a few concepts about uh, fracture now. So if you consider a pure material without any defect, no grain boundary, just a single crystal, perfect single crystal, and you want to break it, so you just pull on it. And from a theoretical calculation, you can get a theoretical strength needed to break the crystal. And this theoretical strength is roughly your young modulus divided by 10. So in case of ice, it would mean 1 gigapascal. Whereas when you break ice in the lab, you get something like one megapascal. So you have three order of magnitude of difference between these two, between the reality and the estimation. So this means that this calculation is only theoretical. And the explanation for this difference is the fact that in your material, because it's not perfect, you have stress concentrator. And I will come back on this uh, very important uh, uh, things uh, later. And Especially cracks are very, very efficient stress concentrator. So when once you have a crack, you will be uh, able to concentrate the stress and to break even further your material. OK, so here, uh, <laughs> there, is, there was some uh, sketch, but uh, they disappear with the uh, when I uh, create the PDF, I'm sorry. This is what this was just a slide to show that to explain some mechanisms which could be um, proposed to explain crack nucleation at the grain scale in ice. They have been observed uh, in the lab, in lab experiments, and uh, <clears throat> uh, the question is that uh, are these mechanisms relevant in case of uh, glacier ice? And I don't think that uh, this is really uh, known so far. But uh, OK, so I will just skip this. I'm sorry. It's not very important for the, for the talk. Anyway. So now I will discuss fracture mechanics and a possible application in case of uh, glacier. So here, oh, sorry. here we consider short time scale. This means that we will consider that the ice is a purely elastic medium. Okay. And we will consider the problem of the propagation or not of an existing fracture. So we already have a, crevasse, a small crevasse. And we would like to know if this crevasse can propagate or not under some stress state. Okay, so the idea is the idea of stress concentration. So as I said before, if you, there is a very big gap between the theoretical strengths of a material and the real strengths that you can measure from lab experiment or whatever. So now if you, uh, oops, sorry, if you <clears throat> uh, add a defect like a hole, just a hole, so you have your uh, material and you have a hole inside, <clears throat> 
and you pull on this material, you will have a stress concentration in the vicinity of the hole. This is very well known from the beginning of last century. But then, okay, see, if the hole is just uh, perfectly circular, the stress concentration is just by a factor of three, so it's not that much. But now, you will consider, instead of a circular hole, an elliptical hole, and you will decrease and decrease the radius of curvature of which is now what you could call your crack tip. Okay? And as you decrease the radius of curvature of the crack tip, the stress concentration increases. And actually, if, you, if the radius of curvature is going towards zero, the stress concentration will increase theoretically to, to an infinity. So this means, this suggests that if your defect is sharp enough, you will be able to concentrate the stress uh, so much that you will be able really to uh, reach the theoretical strength of your material and to break the material. So this is the explanation why a stress con uh, a crack can uh, concentrate the stress and allow to uh, break the atomic bonds. But now <clears throat> we need a criterion to decide whether the crack, an existing crack, will propagate under some stress state or not. So the first approach to deal with this problem was uh, done in the 20s by uh, Alan Griffith from a kind of thermodynamic approach. So he considers that there is, uh, when you create a crack, you create new surfaces in your material, so you spend surface energy. So this surface energy is proportional to the new, uh, the, uh, new area that is, uh, which is uh, created. So it, it increases with the length of the crack, like this. But on the other hand, when you propagate the crack, you will release <coughs> elastic energy. And this release of elastic energy is nonlinear. It's like that. So now, when you calculate the balance between the two, at the beginning, when the crack is very small, it's not favorable to create, to, to, to propagate the crack, to uh, make the, the cracks larger. But if the crack is large enough, then it is uh, favorable in terms of um, uh, energy balance. And there is one specific crack length from which uh, the total energy balance is negative. So this means that uh, when you start to propagate, it's more and more favorable to propagate. So you have an instability, and you <clears throat> your fracture will uh, propagate in an unstable manner. Okay. So this is uh, uh, the, this was the first um, criterion proposed to explain uh, the propagation of uh, a fracture in an elastic medium. But this is not really convenient for a material scientist because you never measure energy or surface energy in your samples. So it's much more convenient to speak in terms of stresses. So that's why the linear elastic fracture mechanics was introduced in the 50s. And so here we consider three, we can consider three, three classical modes of failure. Mode one, which is just pure tension, and mode two and three, which are a sheer mode of failure. But generally, in most material, only mode one really uh, occur at the small scales. And I think that in a case of Kelvin, where we consider crevasses that are opening under longitude under longitudinal stresses, this is a relevant case. So this, uh, in this case, we consider not uh, energy or surface energy and so on. We consider stresses. 
So it has been shown that at the tip of the crack, you have stress concentration because you have these cracks. And this stress concentration can be written like this. So this is a function of uh, the angle here. It doesn't matter. The two important points are here. The first one <coughs> is that the stress, there is a stress singularity. So the stress is increasing and becomes theoretically infinite at the crack tip. And the singularity is in R <coughs> minus uh, uh, one half. And here you have a parameter that we call stress intensity factor that depends on the stress that you applied to your uh, cracks here and to the length, to the square root of the length of the crack. Okay, depends on these two things. And then, if we want to make the connection with the uh, Griffith criterion, it has been shown that you can relate uh, the critical, uh, the energy release rate of the Griffiths with the stress intensity factor and the Young modulus. And so the Griffith criterions can be expressed in terms of stress intensity factor, which is much more convenient because it's on, it, it is expressed in terms of stress and crack lengths, things that we, you can measure or estimate. And you have this criterion for fracture propagation, which is that the stress intensity, fa stress intensity factor should reach some critical value, which is a physical parameter, materials dependent parameter, that we call fracture toughness. And so in ICE, it has been measured in the lab. <clears throat> and this fracture toughness is about 100 to 150 kilopascal meter <clears throat> one half. And now this graph here is very interesting because this is a graph uh, proposed by Ashby in 1989, where it plots the fracture toughness as a function of the Young modulus for many, many, many materials. Okay, this is a uh, log log scale. And here it's a theoretical line. And below this theoretical line, you cannot have uh, the, um, the fracture toughness value are uh, forbidden below this critical line. And ice is here, okay? And you see that it's extremely, you have an extremely low fracture toughness for ice. Here are glasses, for example. Glasses are also very brittle materials. So ice is as brittle as uh, uh, glasses. And the uh, things which is really strange and fascinating with ice is that ice remains brittle even very close to the melting point. And this is very, very special because if you consider, for example, uh, metals, uh, metal uh, at uh, 900 uh, degrees C, it will be completely ductile like uh, chewing gum, okay? <clears throat> but in case of ice, you can still propagate brittle fracture very close to the melting point, even at minus one or even almost at zero uh, degree Kelvin, degree C. Okay, so this is very very special. Okay, so now a uh, few words because I'm not a specialist of that about the application of fracture mechanics to crevasse formation and calving and. <coughs> Fracture mechanics has been used in the past by different authors, starting from Smith, from Smith in 1976, to uh, essentially to try to um, estimate uh, the maximum depth of crevasses given uh, certain uh, uh, st state of stress. So generally, the author considered that the state of stress is a superposition of two things. First one, a longitudinal opening stress, which results from a velocity gradient at the surface of the glacier, and the cryostatic pressure, okay, which is contracting 
the uh, opening of the fracture of the crevasse. And then you can use this time to uh, you will use uh, fracture mechanics as a crack arrest criterion and not a crack propagation criterion. And depending on the okay, you can use this kind of criterion or this one. But uh, the important point here is that, at least qualitatively, this kind of approach can explain several things. The first one is that uh, if you are uh, far from the uh, glacier front, you will have the effect of cryostatic uh, pressure, and this will limit the crevasse penetration. So that's why the surface crevasse cannot go to all the glacier. But then when you approach the glacier front, this uh, cryostatic pressure vanishes. And so this will maybe allow the crevasse to propagate uh, downwards and maybe to trigger calving. You can also explain from this kind of approach that if you have water inside the crevasse, the water will compensate the effect of the cryostatic pressure. So it will allow the uh, crevasse to penetrate more than in the classical case without water. And from this kind of approach, you can also uh, deal with some more uh, sophisticated problem like the stress shielding between neighboring crevasses, if you have many crevasses which are parallel between each other, and so on. So it seems that uh, fracture mechanics can be a quite a useful tool to uh, describe this problem of crevasse propagation and uh, and maybe also calving. But still, there is a problem because now, if you consider uh, this uh, fracture propagation criterion, and if you put numbers inside this criterion, we know that the fracture toughness of ice is about 150 kilopascal per uh, square root of meter. And if now I consider uh, longitudinal tensile stresses at the surface of glacier around, let's say, 50 to 100 kilopascal, then to start to propagate the crevasse, I need a crevasse depth at initiation from, let's say, uh, about few meters, from one meter to few meters. So now I have to explain how I can create, propagate a crevasse down to few meters because it seems that it's not possible to, fracture mechanics does not allow uh, to propagate a uh, crevasse from, uh, from the very beginning under the uh, stresses which are uh, observed on glacier. So we have to explain, we have to introduce another mechanisms to go from uh, the, grain, the crystal size to few meters, at least. So <clears throat> in this case, you can imagine different mechanisms. The first one is that you could have uh, purely ductile crack growth that you can have, for example, in, material, in very ductile materials like uh, metals at high temperature. So in this case, even if the load is not very large, you can uh, break um, the materials because you have diffusion mechanisms and voids grow and so on, which are uh, uh, at play. But this kind of mechanisms does not exist on ice. That's for sure. It has not, never been observed. And there are theoretical arguments to say that it's not possible. So we have to find something, something else. So one possibility is subcritical crevasse growth, and I will discuss this a little bit later. Just now, actually. So what is subcritical crevasse growth? Uh, it has been shown by several authors, essentially in, uh, in rocks, for example, but also in metals, that you can 
propagate a crack even if your stress intensity factor is below the fracture toughness of the material. But in this case, the crack propagation will be very, very slow. And this can be related to various phenomena like corrosion at the crack tip or a phenomenon of fatigue when, if you have a cyclic load loading. And in this case, you have generally you consider that you have different regimes. If you have a stress intensity factor which is very, very, very small, in this case, ne nothing happens. Okay? You have no pro propagation at all. But then the most interesting regime is this one, where the crack grow, the crack grow speed B, will be a power law function of the stress intensity factor with the exponent with a very large exponent. This means that the sensibility sensitivity of crack speed to the factor fact, um, to the stress intensity factor is very large. So when you uh, when your uh, fracture is uh, small or the stress is small, you are growing very 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 slowly. But then <clears throat> it, it increases and increases and increases. And if your crack length increase, the stress intensity factor increase. So you are going like this. Sometimes you can have a saturation, but it's not important here. When, uh, for example, if your uh, subcritical crack grow is uh, controlled by corrosion, and uh, if the co corrosive species cannot uh, diffuse to the crack tip fast enough, you have a kind of saturation. And then you reach, finally, the fracture toughness and the uh, classical instability described by uh, elastic fracture mechanics. So the question now is, can we have subcritical progressing? And is this mechanism able to explain uh, the fact that we can propagate crevasses uh, <clears throat> in a, a stable manner? So to illustrate this, I consider uh, uh, <clears throat> measurement performed uh, in Zurich by uh, the group of Martin Fuchs and Antoine Parlon at the time. And they uh, considered uh, not Kelvin glacier, but uh, hanging glacier in the Alps, like here in the, uh, at Eger. And they measured not the depth or the length of the crevasses, but the opening bet of between this position, for example, and a position upstream. But generally, in fracture mechanics, we can consider that the opening of the fracture is proportional to the crack length. So this is a, a kind of proxy of your crack depth, in this case. And the measurements are the red crosses. Here is the time in day. And here is the relative velocity between the two different points. And what you see is that when you are far before the collapse of the ice cliff, you have almost no change, not, almost not detectable changes of the velocity. But then a few days before the collapse, it starts to increase and increase and increase. And then it goes almost to infinity. Obviously, it never goes to infinity, but still <clears throat> you can it has been shown that this kind of behavior can be explained by this kind of equation, where Tf is the time of collapse of the ice cliff. And this kind of equation is, in fact, what we call a finite time singularity, because at Tf, the velocity goes to almost to infinity. So now, can we explain this by some kind of subcritical crevassing me mechanisms? And in fact, this is the case. If you consider uh, that you have a crevasse like this with the depth L, and you have longitudinal stresses, which is supposed here to be constant, but then you consider that you have a, oops, you have a subcritical propagation, so you are in this regime. So the crack, the crevasse depth is a function, a uh, power law function of the uh, stress intensity factor. And then after some integration, 
you get your uh, crack uh, opening speed, which is like that, and you have here uh, with uh, an exponent uh, which depends on this exponent here, you have uh, finite uh, time singularity, and you have exactly the behavior that we observed before here, something like that. So it seems that, at least in the case of Engling lecture, these mechanisms could maybe, uh, subcritical crevassing could explain the behavior observed on the, on the Engling lecture uh, explored by uh, the group of, of Zurich. So, okay, now we have to uh, think that what kind of mechanisms could be behind this uh, <laughs> subcritical crevassing, if any. It could be some kind of corrosion under stress, if we have the presence of water, of uh, impurities, or whatever. Or now, if we consider a different problem, the problem of, of a floating ice tongue, and if so, maybe it's relevant for in the case of Calvin. If you have the tongue which is floating and you have tides, so your tongue is uh, moving upwards, downward, and so on. <coughs> So you, it's like you have a kind of cyclic loading, okay? And in this case, on other materials than ice, it has been shown that you can have also a kind of subcritical crack propagation. Every time you, uh, your load is uh, going up and down and so on, you are, uh, uh, your crack is moving a little bit further at each loading cycle. And this is also a kind of subcritical crack growth. And uh, I think that there are now some uh, seismic uh, measurements that have been done uh, in, glacier, in, uh, in outlet glaciers that uh, show that the seismic uh, signal is uh, really uh, in phase with uh, the tides. So that may be, uh, related, this is maybe related to this kind of mechanisms. Okay, so still graphs have disappeared, sorry. Um, so uh, I just add this uh, yesterday because uh, <clears throat> we discussed a little bit about this ductile to brittle transition and the competition between uh, fast and slow processes. So now uh, in the context of um, of fracture mechanics, we can also understand the ductile to brittle transition that I explained before. And here it's a micro mechanical approach proposed by Schusson in the 90s, where now you consider a competition between a brittle process, which is a crack propagation, purely uh, brittle propagation, and a ductile one, which is, which is creep. So you consider a material with a crack, okay, it's not, it, the crack disappears, I'm sorry. And uh, you load this crack, but this material can also creep. And it creeps with a classical Glenn's law. And now you consider a characteristic loading time okay, of your process, which is obviously related to it's just the inverse of your loading rate. And uh, then, starting from this loading time, you can define the size of the creep zone ahead of the crack tip, which is defined by the fact that your strain dissipated by creep, which is a function of the time, obviously, through this equation, will be equal to the elastic stress. So uh, I'm sorry the sketch disappeared, but in this case, it means that at the crack tip, you have a zone around the crack tip where the ice will creep. And then, to define the ductile to brittle transition, you, you will say that the deformation is brittle, so the cracks will propagate, if the, <coughs> this uh, creep zone is small enough compared to the length of the crack. Okay? And on the reverse, if, the, if, you, if your loading time is large, so your loading rate is uh, small, you will have 
many, much time to creep the ice at the crack tip and the, this will um, imply that you uh, will not be able to propagate further the cracks and you are on the ductile uh, side of the behavior. Okay, so so far, so so far I discussed uh, fracture mechanics. So in fracture mechanics, we consider the presence of one fracture, one crevasse, and we try to uh, understand if this crevasse can propagate or not under some stress state. But sometimes it's not very uh, useful. Uh, to, uh, it's not possible to consider every uh, fracture by itself. It's too complicated, especially in this kind of uh, situation where you have many, many, many crevasses. And so, in this case, what you would like to do is to try to uh, to um, deal with the field of crevasses and to homogenize all these crevasses. And this is the tool to do that is damage mechanics. So the question, question we can ask here is that, can we deal with fracture or crevasses while keeping a continuum mechanics frameworks? Okay, so this time we do not consider any more fracture mechanics. We want to keep a continuum mechanics framework and this is very convenient, for example, for uh, numerical modeling. And from these tools, we will be able maybe to describe the effect of fracture on the creep of ice. And maybe the ultimate goal would be to simulate the subcritical crevice row from this kind of, of mechanisms. So what is damage mechanics? Uh, so here I was, there was supposed to be some uh, uh, cracks in the, in the material here. Anyway, you can imagine that here you have small cracks everywhere in the material. So damage mechanics have been introduced first by Kachanov in 1958. And then it has been developed a lot, especially by the French school of mechanics, uh, Chabosch, Lemaitre, and so on. So here you consider a piece of ice or a piece of materials with a lot of small cracks, which are not visible here, unfortunately. And you load this uh, piece of material with some force, F. And if you only consider the apparent surface of the material, the stress is just the force divided by the surface. But actually, because you have cracks, in the material, the load is applied on a reduced surface of real material, which is S type here. So the effective stress, which really uh, works on the ato uh, remaining atomic bonds, is F divided by this reduced surface. And this is the effective stress. And you can express this in terms of a damage parameter which is zero when there is no cracks, and which, which is one when um, the material is, is uh, fully uh, broken. Okay? And then the fundamental assumption of damage mechanics is that the rheology of your materials, which is just a function of the strain function of the stress, this rheology can be described through unchanged constitutive equation of your uh, uh, undamaged material, but using the effective stress instead of the apparent stress in your equation. So this is really the fundamental assumption of damage mechanics. And <clears throat> there are also underlying hypotheses which are very important. And the most important one for me is that for this kind of uh, <clears throat> approach to be valid, the fracture have to be small 
compared to what we call the representative volume element. So in uh, here, if this is my representative volume element, the crevasses have to be small compared to this to this one. So this means that you have a limiting size. You cannot use damage mechanics down to the scale of the individual cracks. The fracture have also to be randomly distributed. And in theory, they do not have to interact between themselves. But still, if they interact through uh, redistribution of stresses and so on, you can take this into account in damage mechanics. It's, this is a less important uh, uh, hypothesis here. So now, OK, oops, sorry. So I will discuss this fundamental assumption in two different cases. The first one is elasticity. So this is the Hooke's law for elasticity, okay, with the Young modulus. And now we just replace the apparent stress, the effective stress, by its value, and you get this equation. And this you can define this by instead by using still the apparent stress, but using an effective modulus like this which is smaller than the uh, young modulus of the virgin material. And this is uh, well uh, known and uh, well observed for many, many, many materials, including ice. And this means that damaged ice is less stiff than virgin ice. But then I think that for in the context of Calvin, which is most thing which is more important is to apply damage mechanics to the creep of ice, to Glenn's, so the, to Glenn's floor law. So here I just use Glenn's floor law with here uh, the effective shear stress instead of the apparent uh, shear stress. And I have this expression. And <clears throat> now if I put again the apparent stress, I can explain this equation with uh, enhanced prefactor here. Instead of B, I have B uh, tilde, and with, which is a function of my damage parameter. And this means that damage ice is softer. Okay, And this has been observed at the lab scale, actually, from lab experiment where I created uh, samples with some uh, crack density, okay, at really at the grain scale, and then I uh, looked at um, uh, the creep of this kind of uh, ice with some amount of cracks, and you can see that uh, da damage uh, damage ice creeps faster than uh, when the crack density is increasing. And now this kind of uh, approach is used in glacier for, mo glacier for modeling. It has been used by uh, uh, Pralon et, and Funk and so on <clears throat> to explain what they observed on hanging glacier. And as you know, it is now more and more uh, used in the context of Calvin. But to use that in in the context of calving or in any kind of context, you have to define a damage criterion. So how you will modify your damage parameter. Okay. So this damage criterion has to be expressed anyway in the principal stress space and not strain. Okay. This is very important because the stress and not strain are uh, breaking uh, and damaging uh, the material. So a general formulation can be like that. So you, this is a time evolution of your damage parameter. This is some criterion in the principal stress space, and this is some just some constant, some enhancement factor. And <clears throat> here I just mentioned that I have seen in the literature that uh, some criterion like the von Mises criterion or the Ayers criterion have been used 
in the context of uh, calving and, um, and damage of ice. And I don't think this is really adapted because von Mises criterion is a criterion designed to uh, describe the plastic yield of material. Okay. So it has nothing to do with damage. And in case of air's criterion, it has been used essentially uh, to describe the damage of materials, but where the damage occurred through cavity growth and ductile failure, like this, this kind of things, which is not relevant uh, for ice. So that's why with uh, Jean, we propose something much simpler, much more sim simpler, actually. And we just say that uh, the damage rate is just proportional to the distance between your uh, effective stress state, which is, for example, here, and some threshold intention. Okay. But this can be discussed. Uh, okay, so now I, I'm close to conclude. So to try to finally, uh, to, 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 to try to uh, answer to the question I, I uh, as previously, can we describe the effect of fracture on ice flow? So at, le, at the lab scale, the, the answer is yes. And at the geophysical scale, yes, maybe. Uh, there are some uh, work, recent work that shows that it might be uh, relevant. But now, can we describe the propagation of a single crevasse from damage mechanics? Uh, the answer is more ambiguous. So in case of subcritical crevassing, uh, we could say to some extent, because here is the result of simulation performed by uh, Pralon and Funct on an hanging glacier. And here you see uh, uh, <clears throat> the damage that propagate downwards, and this uh, propagation of damage mimics the propagation of a crack, okay, for crevasse. But here it's important to say that here we are not able to describe the geometry of the crack itself because we are still in a conti in continuum mechanics, so we do not crack the material, we just dam damage it. But at least to give you an idea of the depths of uh, at which the, the, the ice is damaged and, uh, and so on, it seems to work. And finally, can we use damage mechanics to uh, describe the unstable crevasse propagation? And the, the answer here is clearly no, because here elasticity and stress singularities at the crack tip are essential. So in this case, if you want really to describe the unstable propagation of crevasses, you have to use linear elastic fracture mechanics. You cannot use damage mechanics. And I think this is, uh, yeah, this is the end. Thank you.